Hey everybody, I'm DW Terminator, and this is the explanation of how my review scores work. For a lot of people, this is a very confusing topic, so I felt the need to do another video about it. I did one about it years ago, and people have not watched that to any real degree, so here I am doing another one, and I'm making it a lot more visible this time, as well as making it more detailed. That way you don't have any real issues with understanding the way the score scale works. If you have any questions about the way the scale works after the video is done, then please let me know in the comments. But please do not comment until you have watched the entire video, because I will explain every single one of my scores in detail, what they mean, and I will also even give you examples of games that fall within those categories. But before we do that, let's first go over a few major points about the way the scale works in general. First off, they are capstones for the review, not a substitute for the commentary. A lot of people seem to think that they can just skip to the end of the review, look at the score and go, oh well that tells me everything I need to know. It does not. You should instead think of the scores as general categories of recommendation. And while some scores are certainly of a level where I do not recommend the game at all, there are other scores where there is a lot more nuance to them, so you need to pay more attention to the commentary and not just say, oh, well, it's a 3 out of 5, that means whatever. Because there are actually some games where there are certain issues holding them back, and they do actually improve later on. Other times, most of the commentary might fall into one particular score level. Let's just say I'm mostly praising a game and you would think, oh, well, it might be a 4 out of 5 or something like that. But then there's one particular problem that really drags it down. In an instance like that, I may give it a lower score than the majority of the commentary because that flaw is significant enough to do that. And situations like that are why you should always pay attention to the commentary rather than just the score. They go hand in hand with one another. Do not try to separate the score from the commentary. It just doesn't go well. Next point is something that also tends to confuse some people. First off, my score scale is from 0 to 5, but it's in half point increments. So, for example, there's a 0 0.5, there's a 1.5, there's a 2.5, etc. Some people may go, well, DW, why didn't you just do it out of 10 instead? Well, actually, it started out as a singular point system from 1 to 5, and then I ended up introducing more as it went along. It just evolved to meet the needs of the channel. Similarly, a lot of people are confused about why it only applies to certain games. I do not apply this scale to anything released in the year 2000 or before. This is because gaming really started to get very big with the PlayStation 2, Xbox, and GameCube generation, which basically started in 2001. That generation does get a bit murky because you also have to lump the Dreamcast in there and the PlayStation 2 actually released in the year 2000, but it didn't really start to get into full swing until 2001. And there was a noticeable shift between what you saw prior to 2001 and what you saw after 2001. Thus, I set up two categories. The classic reviews are anything from the year 2000 or earlier, and the more modern reviews as they show up in the playlists, or just reviews as you see in the actual video titles, are anything from 2001 or newer. I hold the two sets to different standards. To give you an example, it is completely unreasonable to hold a game that was released in the 80s to the same standards as ones released in the 2000s. And even between the 90s and the 2000s, you saw this massive shift in technology as well as developmental style. And the thing is, pretty much every single modern design trend you can think of stems back to something from 2001 or just a couple of years after 2001. Obviously, the roots of those sorts of things go back to the 90s and the 80s, but you didn't really see it in its modern incarnation until 2001 and more recently. Thus, I went ahead and set the cutoff at 2001, so if the game was released prior to January 1st, 2001, then it's considered a classic. That doesn't necessarily make it a good game, just a classic game. And thus, anything that was released after January 1st, 2001 becomes part of what I call the modern category and gets a review score. Next major point is that scores do not apply to my thoughts on videos, and the reason is quite simple. They are not reviews. Instead, they are incomplete thoughts on a specific topic or a game. Or in some cases, multiple games, because some MTOs do have multiple games in them. Regardless, they are not actual reviews. Either I did not finish the game in question, or it's just an incomplete version of the game that I'm playing. For example, a demo, or a preview build, or a beta. Applying scores to something like that would just be ridiculous. And the last point before we start delving into the actual scores is that you are not supposed to compare scores across genre lines. 
If you compare them within their specific genre, that's perfectly fine. For example, comparing the likes of Rainbow Six Three Raven Shield to Ghost Recon is perfectly acceptable because both are tactical first-person shooters. They're basically held to the same fundamental standards. Comparing the likes of, say, Call of Duty to Age of Empires 3, on the other hand, would be completely absurd because they're two completely different genres held to two completely different sets of standards. In fact, you're really not even supposed to compare similar but distinct genres to one another. To give you another example, it is not reasonable to compare the likes of Call of Duty to Gears of War because they are held to two different sets of standards even though they're both shooters. One is from a third person perspective and one of them is from a first person perspective. You may not necessarily think that that makes a big difference, but it actually does. And if you start comparing games across different genres that are not held to the same standards as one another, then you're going to find that that's going to be a serious problem. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people say, you gave insert first person shooter here a 4 out of 5, but you gave this action adventure hack and slash game a 2 out of 5, therefore you don't know what you're talking about. That is a case of someone using the scale incorrectly. And if you start doing something like that, you will start looking like a complete idiot, so just don't do that. Now then, with the disclaimers out of the way, let's go ahead and start delving into the actual scores themselves. We're going to go ahead and start at the top and work our way down. The highest score that I will give out is a 5 out of 5. Games in this particular category are must-owns, and I say that if you are any sort of serious gamer, you should have a copy of that game in your collection. Period. End of story. They are games that are so good that they will most likely win you over even if you're not actually a fan of the genre in question. They all have top-notch writing and they have top-notch mechanics, even though they are not perfect games. I cannot stress this enough. A 5 out of 5 does not mean the game is perfect. Get that notion out of your head. Instead, it means that any issues the game has are not significant enough to actually hold the game back. To give you a prime example of a game that would be a 5 out of 5 and that I have given a 5 out of 5, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. It is not remotely a perfect game because it uses the D20 system but mechanically, it doesn't have any significant issues, and the writing is top-notch. In fact, it is such a fantastic game that even people who aren't normally fans of role-playing games actually enjoy the living crap out of it. Now the thing is, you will very, very rarely see me give out a 5 out of 5, because there are so few games that I feel are absolute must-owns, whether you're even a fan of the genre or not. And a lot of the games that would actually fall into that category actually came out prior to 2001, so they just wouldn't get a score at all. To give you a prime example of a classic game that I would consider a must-own, even though I actually don't personally like this game all that much, Super Mario Bros. I mean, let's face it, when you think of a video game, that should be one of the very first things that comes to mind. It's an absolute masterpiece, and even though I don't like it, I would still say that any self-respecting gamer should own a copy of Super Mario Bros. But like I said, that's a classic title and it does not fall under the purview of the 5 out of 5 score or just the score scale in general. So to summarize, the 5 out of 5 is a game that I absolutely recommend to every single gamer out there whether you're normally a fan of that genre or not and it's something that I can very easily recommend at full price, which is something that is a fairly big deal for me because I try to be as frugal as possible. There's really only one major distinction between the 5 out of 5, which is the highest score I give, and the second highest score I give, which is the 4.5 out of 5. Because the 4.5 out of 5 is an absolutely fantastic game that is a shining example of its own genre. The thing is, it is only an absolute must for fans of that genre, because if you're not already a fan of the genre, it may still not win you over. Now, if you're the kind of person that would be looking to get into that genre, then a 4.5 out of 5 game is a fantastic place to start, because it still might win you over. Much like the 5 out of 5 games, they are sublimely polished games with top-notch writing and mechanics, it's just that they have enough smaller problems that fans of the genre can very easily overlook or outright accept as just part of the genre, but a general audience might have some problems with. But regardless of whether you're already a fan of the genre or if you're looking to get into the genre, these are the only other games on this scale that I would actually recommend at full price. And to give you a couple of prime examples of games that would fall into this category, Psychonauts and Jedi Knight 2 Jedi Outcast, both of which are absolutely fantastic games within their own genres. But a major source of strength for Psychonauts is the sense of humor, which is going to fall flat for a lot of sticks in the mud out there. And of course, Jedi Knight 2 Jedi Outcast has the intro bits where the game is at its weakest 
list, and that might be a bit of a deal breaker for some people who aren't really all that big on first person shooters. But if the sense of humor in Psychonauts is your kind of thing, or you're into first person shooters, then I really can't recommend Psychonauts or Jedi Knight 2 Jedi Outcast highly enough. They are both absolutely brilliant games within their genres, and in fact, I wasn't even expecting I would like Psychonauts all that much when I played it, and it ended up being something that was absolutely brilliant, so go figure. Next on the scale is the 4 out of 5. These are excellent games that are gems within their own genre, but they do have some pretty significant flaws. And unlike in the case of the 4.5s, these are flaws that aren't really easy to ignore. They're something that's probably not going to tank the experience for you, but they're definitely enough to give you some pause and make you want to do your resource before you actually buy the game. So this is things like mechanics that are generally very good, but one particular aspect is a real problem, or there's a bunch of technical problems like bugs and glitches, even though the game itself is great, things like that. And because of those things, these games still come with high recommendations, it's just that you should wait for a sale in order to pick them up. Really, I would say that the minimum discount you should be looking for for a 4 out of 5 game is about 25%. So maybe not necessarily something that you would want to get at full price, but close to full price is perfectly reasonable. And to give you some prime examples of games like that, Deus Ex Human Revolution, The Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, and Return to Castle Wolfenstein. Return to Castle Wolfenstein is a fantastic first person shooter, but the stealth mechanics are barely even functional, and there's one particular area of the game where you have to use those stealth mechanics, and it just ends up being a total chore at that point. Deus Ex Human Revolution, on the other hand, is a fantastic game, it's just that they force you into boss fights too much, and there are a few issues here and there with the plot. And then there's Morrowind, which is generally a pretty fantastic game, except that it has a massive amount of technical problems, and the combat system is kind of garbage. But if you can look past the flaws in those particular three games, then you will find that they are excellent games that are well worth playing, but I don't necessarily recommend them at full price. Now, of course, in the case of an older title like Morrowind or Return to Castle Wolfenstein, it's not going to be that expensive to begin with, so in those particular instances, you're not really going to get them at full price anyway, so it's not really something you need to worry about too much, but for something like Deus Ex Human Revolution, where it had come out more recently, then that would be something to keep in mind. Next up is the 3.5 out of 5. These are games that succeed within the context of their own genres, but they do have quite a few problems that prevent them from being anything higher on the scale. And unlike games in the 4, and especially 4.5 and 5 categories, these just will not win you over unless you're already a fan of the genre in question, or the series in question. Generally speaking, these games are mechanically sound, and they do have pretty solid writing, it's just nothing that's really going to impress you all that much, and there may be some pretty significant technical problems that do prevent enjoyment, things like bugs or glitches or, of course, performance issues. The thing is, all of these problems are not enough to completely prevent enjoyment of the game, it's just that there are enough barriers to entry that your average gamer will probably want to wait for a pretty significant discount in order to pick these games up. Things like 50% off or more, for example. And to give you a couple of prime examples of games that would fall into this category, Shadowrun Returns and Civilization VI. Both of these are very good games, it's just that you pretty much have to be a fan of the genres they're in to be able to enjoy them to begin with. Civilization VI's changes weren't really enough to make it really accessible to a wider audience, nor were they even something that are going to be a massive change from Civ V, and Civ V is simply in a better state right now if you want to get into the genre. Similarly, Shadowrun Returns is a solid role-playing game, it's just that if you're not really a fan of role-playing games, particularly in the older style, and especially if you're not a fan of Shadowrun, you'll probably not be able to get the most out of it. If you're looking to get into the genre, then there are other games out there that are a lot more accessible than something like Shadowrun Returns, which is fairly stat-heavy and does require some knowledge of the Shadowrun system to really be able to enjoy it. So if you're not already familiar with Shadowrun, or you don't have experience playing other role-playing games, then you might find it a bit confusing. But 4X fans will be able to enjoy Civilization VI, and role-playing game fans will definitely be able to enjoy Shadowrun Returns, it's just that they may want to wait for a good discount on them before they go ahead and pull the trigger on that. Next up we have a score that seems to confuse an awful lot of people, the 3 out of 5. This means that the game is average, it does not mean the game is bad, it does not mean the game is good, it means it's somewhere in the middle. The term you would really use to describe games like this is competent. Generally speaking, games in this category are mechanically sound, it's just that they have a few significant issues, or it's just completely unremarkable mechanics. Where there might be a specific gimmick that the game uses, but that particular gimmick loses its steam very quickly. 
Or in some cases, they don't even have a gimmick in there. It's just using the same old thing you've seen in many, many other examples of the genre without any real finesse to it. The writing in games like this is often pretty lackluster or very utilitarian and ends up being something that kind of falls on the back burner. It may have pretty unremarkable characters or weird motivations or occasional plot holes or more often than not, just very simplistic storylines that don't really do much for you. And games of this category will definitely not win you over unless you're already a fan of the series in question or the genre. Because, like I said, they're very unremarkable games. This does not mean they're not worth playing at all, it's just that if you're going to pick one of these up, it better be at a very significant discount. The absolute minimum discount I recommend for a game in the 3 out of 5 category is 50% off. If you're paying more than that, then most likely you are paying way too much. Because these games are decent enough that you won't really feel like you're completely wasting your time with them, it's just that they're so unremarkable that you end up kind of forgetting about them after a while. So to give you a couple of prime examples of that, the Tomb Raider reboot from 2013 and the game Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor. Shadow of Mordor falls into the gimmick problem, where it's basically Assassin's Creed with the Batman Arkham style combat system, but it's done in a really lackluster manner, and the only really significant gameplay tweak that they did was introducing the Nemesis system, which is a really cool idea that ends up just kind of falling flat on its face after a while. In the case of Tomb Raider 2013, the writing is not very good, and of course there's the problem of the gameplay being fairly bog-standard stuff for a 3D action-adventure game at this point. Which means that none of the mechanics are really refined enough to make the game actually worth playing at full price, because it leaves a lot to be desired. Which is of course also the case with Shadow of Mordor and really any other game in this category. Now we're starting to get into the scores that are below average, which means that we're getting into the games that I don't recommend or I recommend with only very strict stipulations. Case in point, the 2.5 out of 5, which means that the game is underwhelming or mediocre. These are games that are certainly playable and you may be able to get some enjoyment out of them, but it's not going to be very much and they're going to be very, very forgettable titles in the long run. More often than not, they have rather weak writing where characters just don't have very good motivations or they're just not very well written characters in general or there may be some pretty noticeable plot holes. In addition, the mechanics are most likely somewhat weak. The game might have some very awkward controls that prevent otherwise very average gameplay mechanics from functioning as well as you might hope, or the mechanics themselves are simple facsimiles of what even an average game might be, meaning that they might be more sluggish or slightly less responsive, or they may even be simplified compared to what the average game or especially a good game would be. Which ultimately makes games like this only really appealing to people who are already fans of the genre or series in question, especially the series in question. Question. And it's something that the only recommendation I can make for it is if you get it for maybe 10 bucks or less. Like I said, games in the 2.5 out of 5 category are very forgettable. They're decent enough platforms for expanding in later titles, of course, or especially with DLCs or expansion packs, but in the state they're being reviewed in, there are simply way better options out there. To give you a couple examples of this, Stronghold 2 and Hotline Miami 2. Stronghold 2 launched with a ton of technical problems that really held the game back, and even after it got patched up, it's still mechanically inferior to the previous two games in the series. It really did not weather the transition to 3D very well, and even though it's not a terrible game or anything, it's just not anywhere near as good as the previous two games, which means that the only people who are really going to be able to get that much out of it are diehard Stronghold fans. And even diehard Stronghold fans won't really want to pick it up unless it's on a really good discount. Then of course there's Hotline Miami 2, which is not a bad game, it's just that it doesn't really seem to understand what made the original game good. It tried to expand upon the original, but it ended up actually going counterintuitive to its own core gameplay design, which ended up making the overall experience rather mediocre. Now fans of Hotline Miami will probably still be able to enjoy it, it's just that if you're not already a fan of Hotline Miami, I wouldn't really recommend it. Because the first game is a lot better, and it's already a niche game to begin with, so that doesn't help matters. But for fans of Hotline Miami, I could recommend it as long as you're not paying more than maybe 10 bucks for it. But of course, fans of Hotline Miami are the only people that I would recommend it to. Now we start to get into the stuff that's a lot more negative. The 2 out of 5 is a generally rather weak or subpar game. These games are well below average and definitely need a lot of work in order to become anything remotely decent. That said, a game in this category is not a completely lost cause. 
They could be improved with DLC or especially patches or even expansion packs. But in their current states, they are often very mechanically unsound to the point where the game actually just becomes mind-numbingly boring. And or they have writing that is weak with a lot of poor character motivations and characterizations or very apparent plot holes or even other issues where there might be some issues with flow or something jumping ahead too far or jumping back too far. Games in this category more often than not also have a lot of technical problems, whether that be bugs and glitches or serious performance problems. To give you a couple of prime examples of games that get 2 out of 5s, Quantum Break and Risen 2 Dark Waters. Quantum Break has some pretty significant performance problems on top of the fairly weak mechanics as well as the noticeably weak writing. And it's to the point where it takes what was a really cool premise and just turns it into something that ends up being really boring. Risen 2, on the other hand, takes what was a pretty solid foundation in Risen 1 and just screws it up. The writing and the mechanics in it are just too weak for it to be recommended in its current state. The problem is that even with DLCs, it didn't really improve. And the thing about a 2 out of 5 is that I don't recommend games within this category. They're just not worth getting in their current state. You may want to wait for them to be patched up and see if they improve after the patches, or if they improve after getting all the DLCs included, something like that, but they are not worth getting in their current state. And certainly I don't recommend Quantum Break or Risen 2 Dark Waters. Now we come to the last score where the game can possibly redeem itself at some point. That is the 1.5 out of 5, which means that the game is bad, it fails significantly at doing what it sets out to do. These games are mechanically unsound to the point where there are actually rather few or no redeeming qualities about the gameplay and it actually becomes outright irritating to play it. The writing generally goes beyond simply being weak and ends up becoming outright bad, where characters have very poor motivations, there's far too much simplicity or it tries to be way too complex and just fails miserably at it, and most likely there are a lot of plot holes. Games in this category also tend to be absolutely plagued with bugs or glitches and performance issues, which are things that can be improved with patches of course. But while the 2 out of 5 still shows some degree of hope, at a 1.5 stage, improvement is very unlikely. It is still possible, but very unlikely. And if a game manages to fall into the 1.5 out of 5 category, then it's just not worth getting at all, even if you can get it at a strong discount. To give you a couple of examples of this, Assassin's Creed 3 and Call of Duty Ghosts. Assassin's Creed 3 is just a technical disaster even though it has been patched significantly and of course it has rather bad writing and the mechanics are just wimpy. Then you move over into Call of Duty Ghosts and you find that the gameplay is at its very best the bog standard that you've seen for Call of Duty games up to that point but it's done in a manner that is very contrived, the plot is outright terrible, the characters are pathetic, and of course the multiplayer is pretty much dead as well as being horrendously unbalanced. And on top of all of that, it has pretty bad netcode and rather significant performance problems. But if the 1.5 out of 5 sounds bad, then it only gets worse from there, because the next score available is the 1 out of 5. These are terrible games. They fail completely at being games within their own genres. For a game to hit this category, it has to be mechanically broken, often to the point where the game is barely even playable. But there are even some games that are definitely playable, it's just that the mechanics are so broken that it doesn't really matter that the game is playable. So for example, if you hop into a multiplayer game and it is so unbalanced that a new player is going to get completely crushed until they've simply grinded for hours and hours and hours until they've unlocked the good stuff, then it's quite simply a pretty mechanically broken game. Likewise, if the game has hit this particular category, then it's almost certain that the writing is so incredibly terrible that it's practically insulting to your intelligence. It's the kind of thing that will give you a headache if you try to make any sort of sense out of it. And of course, there's also the issue of the game being to a barely playable point due to bugs, glitches, or performance problems. Now, a game doesn't necessarily have to be barely playable due to bugs, glitches, and performance problems to land in this category, but it is very likely that it will be. And if the game is put into this category because it is barely playable due to bugs, glitches, and performance problems, then it's still so bad that the best it could really hope to achieve while being passed 
patched up is a 1.5. This is the level where a game becomes truly irredeemable because there's just so much wrong with it that they couldn't possibly fix all of it without making a completely brand new game. So to give you a couple of prime examples of this, Two Worlds and Fallout 4. About the only amusing thing about Two Worlds is that they use this really terrible old-timey speech. Everything else about it is a completely miserable experience. The writing is a complete disaster and the gameplay itself is mind-numbingly boring on top of being pretty mechanically broken. Everything about it is horrendously janky, and it even still has performance problems to this day, on top of having bugs and glitches that hold it back. Then of course there's Fallout 4, which is so terrible that it took me two hours to explain in detail just how terrible it is. Now of course this brings up something that's a bit coincidental. Now my Fallout 4 review is the longest video I've ever done. It's over two hours long. But just because a review is long does not necessarily mean the game is bad. I want you to get that notion out of your head. It just means there's a lot to discuss. In Fallout 4's case, there are so many things wrong with it that I just went ahead and went into detail about it and it took me two hours to do so. So if you want the particulars of that, I definitely recommend watching that review because I explain that in detail and I don't want to do that here, otherwise this video would be ridiculously long too. But short version, writing is atrocious, gameplay is atrocious, it's horrendously buggy and unstable software. And of course, if anything is in the 1 out of 5 territory, I recommend that you avoid it entirely. Stay well away from these games because they are that bad. Now, of course, it goes without saying that very, very few games get the 1 out of 5. Even less get the 0.5 out of 5, which is an astoundingly terrible game. These are games that don't simply completely fail at being a game, they actually fail at being software. They are games that are so mechanically broken that the game is either completely unplayable or so near it that playing it is an infuriating exercise that just results in misery. The writing in games this bad ends up being so incredibly terrible that it is completely insulting to your intelligence, and it's so bad that it actually makes fan fictions like Doom Repercussions of Evil look like literary masterpieces. A game in this category will also most likely be practically unplayable just because it's so ridiculously buggy or it has horrendously poor performance. And I don't recommend that you simply stay away from these games, I recommend you avoid them as if they are plague infested rats. To give you a couple of prime examples of this, Darkest of Days and Take Down Red Saber. When Take Down Red Saber launched, it was almost completely unplayable just because it was so horrendously buggy and so craptastic in its performance. On top of that, mechanically, it is a complete disaster where you'll try to aim at things and your aiming will actually be off. The AI is completely brain dead and on top of all of that, the multiplayer functionality pretty much doesn't even work. About the only positive you can say is that the writing is not insultingly terrible because there pretty much isn't any writing. Which is certainly not the case with Darkest of Days, which has one of the worst storylines I have ever seen in a video game. On top of that, the mechanics are to the barely playable level of broken, and in fact they're so hilariously broken that the game goes past being so bad it's funny, and right back to being a completely miserable experience. And on top of all of that, the game is so broken from a simple software standpoint that I actually had to only use screenshots for that video, because I couldn't actually record the game. It would crash every single time I tried to do that. Now, of course, this means that there's quite a lot of schadenfreude in watching my videos on these, because more often than not, I end up kind of ranting about the game in question, because it's just so incredibly terrible. But the fact remains that if you do try to play one of these games, the experience is going to be so thoroughly miserable that you will wish that you had not even heard of it before. So like I said, avoid games in the 0.5 category like the plague. But then there's the category below a 0.5 out of 5 that I hoped I would never have to use, and I ended up having to use it once. That is the 0 out of 5. A game of this category is an unfathomable abomination. It is something that is so incredibly terrible that it completely defies logic. It is the kind of game that is so indescribably bad that you sit there wondering if this is even reality or not. The kind of game where you stare at your screen just going, how does this even exist? And like I said, I have only had to give one game that score, and that game is Ride to Hell Retribution. 
It is a game that completely defies logic, and it makes you wonder how it could possibly even exist, it is so terrible. When a game has managed to hit the 0 out of 5, it has gone beyond simply failing completely at being a game, as well as failing completely at being software, and has become simply a horrifying mass of pain and misery. A game that has managed to get a 0 out of 5 deserves to be banished to the deepest, darkest pits of hell and completely forgotten. Now, like I said, I have only ever given out a single 0 out of 5, and I hope it stays that way. Now, of course, the reality of my score scale is that most games are going to fall somewhere between the 1.5 and the 3.5. That's just a reality of gaming as a whole. And I hope that after watching this video, you understand how the scale works. Obviously, no system is going to be perfect, and there's always going to be people out there who look at the scores and seem to think that they somehow translate to whatever madness they've got in their own heads. But here's the thing. If you don't understand how the scale works after having watched this video, then please comment below about the scale itself, not individual scores that I have given out, and I'll try to explain it as best I can. Thank you all very much for watching, and I'll catch you all in later videos.